All right. Thanks, Jim. And thanks to um, Justin and Brett as well for organizing this great series of talks. Like Matt said, it's been a welcome distraction from uh, um, from everything that's going on. So um, the work that I'll be talking about today, like Jim said, was um, in completion of my thesis work here at SLU um, regarding uh, composite analysis and identifying uh, fire effective features in the Southern Great Plains. And this is work that uh, Todd had started um, and has been work has been um, kind of um, pioneering for the last 15 years with Greg Murdoch and a few others um, out there in Southern region. Uh, but um, we wanted to take a, uh, a another crack at this using a system relative approach to compositing, which I'll talk about um, a little bit later in the talk. So um, the whole, the feature that we're we're trying to identify a little, or the, uh, the, ev the event that we're trying to identify a little bit more uh, clearly are these uh, phenomena called Southern Great Plains wildfire outbreaks. Um, and this loop that you'll that you're looking at is uh, fire temperature from go 16 um, from uh, March 6th of 2017 otherwise known as the Starbuck fire uh, Northwest uh, Oklahoma complex fire uh, Dumas fire complex all these different names for it um, but what you notice uh, right off the bat and this is only a seven or eight hour loop of uh, of, um, of satellite data uh, some characteristics of these outbreaks rapid growth i mean you're you're seeing a lot of a lot of spot fires um grow quite rapidly as um uh, along prevailing winds in the in the lowest levels of the atmosphere um organized spread like i said they follow the 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 low level flow um an expansive burn area i'm not sure i think this one burned a couple over a million acres of land when all was said and done uh and then uh, an abrupt change in direction <laughs> excuse me an abrupt change in direction um, usually associated with a cold front or some sort of prefrontal wind shift, because um, these uh, these outbreaks tend to occur with the presence of mid-latitude cyclones uh, tracking through the southern Great Plains. So there's a lot of moving parts that go into this, um, into the into these phenomena, and it's becoming more and more important in the in the Great Plains uh, to be able to um, pick out which patterns in the atmosphere um, are more conducive for these outbreaks to occur. Uh, one of those uh, one of those features that has been identified by Todd and by Greg Murdoch and a few others uh, through several papers is a low level thermal ridge, and more importantly, that pr the presence of that feature along with a mid level jet streak. So this uh, conceptual model that I'll show you is pretty well outlined in uh, Todd's paper from 2017 in the Journal of Operational Meteorology. First thing you need is warmer boundary layer temperatures. So anything from the surface up to 850 or a little bit higher than that. Um, you're, you're, um, you want to be anomalously warm, not just warm, but um, anomalously warm. And uh, this satellite data that's underlaid is from that same March 6, 2017 case, and those black spots will represent uh, where the fires are either ongoing or have already passed through. Then the second thing you need is some sort of forcing. So strong mid-level jet streak intersecting that low-level thermal ridge, preferably on the drier side. So you could imagine that would be the western side of that LLTR. And then in the middle of that, if you notice, that's where you're going to get your concentration of, um, of wildfires um, that are igniting and then will uh, rapidly develop. Um, so through all of this, the key, fee the key idea about all of this is to be able to objectively identify these patterns. Um, and SIPS does an excellent job of that. Um, Todd has told me time and time again that SIPS has been an invaluable asset to forecasting these outbreaks. Um, by by leveraging past events, um, you know, past data with with uh, current GEFS forecasts in order to identify which uh, which patterns look more like uh, outbreak patterns. Um, but we want to further refine that atmospheric conceptual model and utilize SIPs to a greater extent um, to uh, to help uh, figure out what more specific um, features are conducive for these outbreaks. Once we've developed that, that conceptual model using, like, like I said earlier, a system relative composite, um, which I'll talk about a little bit later, we want to develop and implement a systematic method to score those patterns. So you don't want, we want to be subject, we want to be objective in this situation as opposed to um, anecdotally remembering what pattern looks like um, a wildfire outbreak pattern. So that was the real, um, real goal of this research was to be more objective in our analysis of, of these features. Um, after that, once we've scored these patterns, we were able to identify some differences between events and false alarms. 
Um, it says if any exist, you know, it, there, there are some that exist and I'll show those a little bit later. And then finally, we wanted to test the forecast skill of the scoring paradigm um, against uh, uh, GEFS data. So we wanted to see how a, for, a GEFS forecast with lead time um, performed in identifying the atmospheric features for a high-end event and for a marginal non-event. Um, bottom line, though, the, we, we want to bring awareness to the presence of a predictable pattern for these phenomena and then develop a tool to bring a more holistic context to forecasting these outbreaks. Um, <clears throat> but what's important to remember is that weather plays one key role. It is not the key role. And whether you're in the Southern Great Plains or in the Western US or on the High Plains, this is always going to be true. Um, this, this is ripped shamelessly from the, comet, from the comet module that we all have to take as we enter the weather service um, from fire weather. Um, but this, this is, this is the, the, the bellwether of, of fire weather forecasting, the fire triangle, um, fuels, weather, and topography. And while each one of these is important, they aren't equally important depending on your situation. Sometimes you can lean on the weather aspect to compensate for a lack of topographic influence or fuels can be the main driver and weather may not be as conducive. So um, I do wanna just underscore that before we go any further, that this is a purely atmospheric look at, the, um, at, these, at these outbreaks, um, but there are ways to incorporate fuels. However, we haven't done that just yet in this research. So the first thing that we did was to, con we created a conceptual model or rather instead of creating it, we refined it. Um, using a system relative approach. So we use the North American regional reanalysis data set uh, that SLU houses uh, and SIPS um, houses uh, to use uh, for their um, for their analog uh, for their analog guidance. Um, also because Todd had used that data set in his in his work um, to identify these composites. Um, and we took 27 Southern Great Plains wildfire outbreak cases in the domain that you see there on the right. And then the fields are plotted over the region of interest. And what I mean by that is because we are using a system relative composite approach rather than a geographically relative approach, where you put these, these features really doesn't matter. Um, so normally when you take a geographically relative approach, you will just composite all of the fields, however, feel, however many fields you're gonna do, um, and then however many cases where they lie. You don't move them, you don't alter them, you just keep, you keep everything the same. And while that is important for some patterns, um, which, uh, which may not have as many topographic influences as this has, a system relative approach really narrows down the atmospheric component to everything. So what we do is we identify the low pressure, the low pressure centers, and those are marked by the blue dots there on, on, the, on the screen, and we move all of those lows to one common location. And then we move all of the features associated with those lows to that same common location. Um, and then we take the composite from there. So it's really focusing in on the system itself and not the, um, the effects of topography and, and uh, water bodies and stuff. The best way to or, um, illustrate this is to show you an example of geographically relative versus system relative. So this is, this, this is real data from my, from my work. Um, on the left, you see two meter temperature and mean sea level pressure in black. Um, uh, a composite at 20, or valid at 21Z for the, for the 27 cases. And on the right is a system relative composite of the same field. Um, for the geographically relative composite, you can make out a mid-latitude cyclone. I mean, we can subjectively see that. And the makings of possibly a low level, low, low level thermal ridge, um, but it's kind of broad. And what's more important is that these, the, the topography, the, you know, the, the Rockies and the, and the coastline of the, Gulf of Mexico and even the coastline of the um, of the Great Lakes is affecting the pat the uh, the pattern the atmospheric pattern a little bit. So it's causing um, while subjectively we can just weed that out and say okay we we can ignore that we know that's topographic influence um, when we're doing an objective analysis that can hurt our scores. So we don't want that where we want as little um, influence on these on these uh, for these geographic features as possible. So we. Um, so after applying the system relative methodology to everything, things look a lot smoother. Um, it's a lot more evident where the low level thermal ridge is and how amplified it is. And it's also um, the effects of the mountains is reduced. I wouldn't say eliminated, but definitely reduced. And the effects of the water bodies is again reduced, but not eliminated. So this is the importance of, of um, refining the atmospheric 
conceptual model in a system relative sense. Um, then what we did was we scored the individual cases against the conceptual model. So we took each one of the cases and said, how does that compare to our composite? Um, we used correlation for each of these fields for each date and time. Um, we didn't do magnitude in this study mainly because we couldn't figure out a way to normalize it other than um, having some standardized anomalies, which presented some data issues um, while, uh, while we were here. We were running short on time, uh, but we plan to do that for future, for future uh, work. But the correlation is going to basically tell us how similar the pattern is in one case against the conceptual model. So each field can theoretically score between a negative one and a one. Um, and the nine fields that we scored are mean sea level pressure, two meter temperature, 850 temp, um, 850 winds and heights, and 500 winds and heights, uh, and uh, two meter dew point and two meter RH. So we've got moisture fields in there, we've got temp fields in there, and we've got some mass fields as well. Um, so those nine fields, the correlation of those nine fields against the composite are then summed. So a maximum total score of nine is possible for any given event. And I just want to underscore the fact that this has no, there, that magnitude does not play a role in, uh, in, in the scores. It should, and we are going to work on um, modifying the scoring. But right now, we're purely looking at the similarity of the two patterns. And then it shakes out like this. So anything closer to zero on the, on the, for the scores or even lower than zero, even though no event scored that low, um, is, a, is a poor score and therefore a non-event. Um, anything getting towards five and a half to six, and I'll back that up with some statistics later on, is, cons is considerably fair um, and possibly a false alarm. So you've got some events that scored that low and some non-events that scored that high. So you've got a, a mixed bag there. And then finally, as you get closer to nine, and no, sc no event scored a perfect score, but um, as you get closer to nine, you've got more likelihood of an event occurring or more likelihood that the pattern is conducive for a, um, an outbreak. So the scores of these events and non-events can help identify the false alarms. That's the, that's the uh, sweet spot that we're trying to hone in on, which is important in more accurate prediction. So let's take a look at some of these composites and, and uh, in a planar view. Um, so you've seen this one already. This is the 21, uh, 21 UTC, uh, um, two meter temperature in red and, and uh, mean sea level pressure in black. Um, what's evident right off the bat is a strong mid-latitude cyclone tracking through the region. Um, this map is underlaid just for spatial reference. It's not for geographic reference of any kind. So you can move this feature, um, these features south, north, east, west, and um, uh, things would be the same, but they're just there for spatial reference. The other thing that I that is uh, arguably just as important is that what amplified well-defined warm sector or the surface LLTR. So I've highlighted that in yellow, and I want you to keep that in mind uh, as we move forward, specifically the position of that of that LLTR, because as we'll see later on, relative locations matter for these phenomena, and that is true in multiple facets of meteorology, severe weather, fire weather, um, flooding. It, it's relative locations definitely matter. Um, as we move up in the atmosphere to 850, the black lines still represent mean sea level pressure, but the red lines now represent 850 temperatures. Um, that warmer tongue of air definitely does extend into the well into the boundary layer. We've got a well-mixed boundary layer for sure. Um, we'll see that later on. Um, and the two LLTRs are co-located with respect to the mid-latitude cyclone. So we've got um, really good consistency as we move up in the atmosphere that there is a strong um, wedge of warm air uh, within the boundary layer. So great, we've got a sufficiently warm atmosphere, so that's one of our necessary conditions um, that we need for, uh, for, for, this, uh, for this phenomenon, or at least for fire weather in general. Um, but now we have to check if it's dry enough. And to do that, we'll take a look at RH. And I mentioned that we scored both RH and dew point, um, but for the sake of time, we'll just look at RH. So I think it tells a better picture of, um, of, uh, of, of, the, of, this, uh, of this pattern. So you notice right away, there's a pretty considerable dry slot right here. Um, west of the LLTR, um, clipping the LLTR's western edge right near the axis of it. So we'll highlight that in brown. And again, relative locations still matter. So there's this overlap between the western LLTR and or western half of the LLTR and the eastern kind of third of the of the dry slot of air um, behind arguably the dry line that's uh, advancing ahead of the cold front. Um, so taking a look at this, you know, outbreak checklist or um, fire checklist in general, we are hot and we're dry, perfect. So we have the necessary conditions that are, that are uh, 
that are in place for fire weather in general. But what makes these setups different? What makes this an outbreak as opposed to a spot fire or a smaller, uh, smaller scale um, uh, fire event? And the answer looks to be the forcing. Um, winds aloft and, and whether or not they mix down to the surface effectively. Um, so what we're looking at here is at 2100 UTC, 850 heights in black and uh, 850 winds in, uh, in the contours and in, in the red contours and in the shading and the barbs. So what we notice is we've got our low, we got a low level jet southerly, um, uh, so, you know, south north oriented just to, to the southeast of below. But we've also got this secondary kind of extension, I'm not, not really sure what you want to call it, um, to, uh, to the uh, south of the low and more southwest northeast oriented. Um, and if you overlay the two layer or the two areas of warmer and drier air, the secondary extension of the low level jet intersects these two features right here um, and in this image in, this, in central Oklahoma. But again, this is, this is system relative, so this doesn't have to be in central Oklahoma. Um, so the war not only is warmer, drier air being further advected into the system, but this secondary jet, this strange kind of arm of the low level jet is now um, intersecting these two features, providing some forcing. Um, but where does that secondary jet originate? Uh, just in, and we'll take a look at the time series in a minute. It actually doesn't persist with time, which is kind of strange. Um, so to do, so to investigate a little bit further, we looked aloft at 500, uh, 500 millibars, and we take a look at winds and heights at this level. And what we notice is that where those two intersect, right here in this kind of sweet spot on the dry side of the LLTR, we're in a favored area for subsidence. So we're in the right exit region of the fi of the mid-level jet. And we're getting in, we're getting some sort of subsidence aloft that's mixing stronger winds down to the not really to the surface, but down to um, maybe 850, maybe a little bit higher than that. Um, so there is some sort of dynamic forcing that's bringing this bringing this uh, these wind speeds down a little bit further in the atmosphere. So we're hot enough, we're dry enough, and we possibly have forcing. Um, but we have to investigate this a little bit further. And the best way to look at this is to look at a composite cross-section. And normally composite cross-sections don't pan out very well. They don't, um, since they're, uh, since they're generally, uh, they generally wash out features. They're not the best thing to look at, but we look at it anyway. And it, and it actually does show um, pretty much what we were expecting it to show, which was, which was very encouraging. So this is again valid at 21, uh, 21Z on the day of ignition um, for all 27 events. And up here is where the cross section was actually taken um, in the in the system relative composite. And you can see that um, in the in the shaded, we've got temperatures above five degrees Celsius. Uh, the green lines are isotropes and Kelvin, and the black line, back, thicker black lines are um, are isotacts and knots. And what you notice is on the western side of the LLTR, we've got this. The uh, the isotropes are are very very spaced out, so really weak. Um, almost nearly neutral stability in the atmosphere. They're not necessarily decreasing with height yet, but they're approaching, the, the lapse rates are approaching uh, very small numbers, very small uh, positive numbers, which is indicative of nearly neutral stability. So the enhanced, the enhanced uh, subsidence aloft of 500 uh, millibars might be pushing down or, or mixing down these winds to um, the lower levels of the atmosphere and then um, with it, without any buoyant force opposing it, these winds are more easily mixing down to the, to the lowest levels of the atmosphere. And, you, and, it's, and it's evident by this uh, 25 knot isotack, which is scraping around 900 to 925 uh, millibars, uh, which is, which is um, um, a little bit you know, on the stronger side. And you'll see compared to the false alarms, it's definitely stronger. Um, so the key here seems to be whether or not we get, um, we, whether or not we get coupling in the atmosphere, whether or not we have the mid levels and the low levels uh, coupling together, and and uh, mo and um, momentum transfer coming down to the surface. Uh, so there's a lot that goes into whether or not these systems um, or these uh, features come together at the same time in the same place, um, oriented correctly. And as we'll see in a minute, it also depends on your time of day because if you're if this feature occurs or, or if all of these dynamic forcings occur at the same time and are in the right place 
but your low level thermal ridge hasn't fully developed, let's say you're at 3Z instead of 21Z or 0Z, you're not going to get that, 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 ne that neutral stability in the lowest part of the atmosphere that will allow for mixing down to the surface. So let's take a look at some loops. We're not gonna look at all of those loops or all of those images again, but some interesting um, temporal evolutions. This is two meter temperature and mean sea level pressure. You note it from 12Z to 0Z every three hours on the day of the event. Um, and you notice as you get closer to your diurnal peak heating around 21 to 0Z, that low level ridge, uh, low level thermal ridge starts to uh, fully develop and, and narrow and become more intense. I mean, you expect that. So really what we're, we're honing in on is that there is a very important temporal aspect to this, and this is this has been known. You know, if you don't, if you're not going to get these these forcings during peak heating, you're not going to get um, you're you're not going uh, wildfire outbreaks are very unlikely to occur um, since you don't have the the necessary um, the necessary conditions in place just yet. This is the 850 evolution. This is still mean sea level pressure and now 850 temperatures, and you see that that low level thermal ridge, at least aloft is persistent throughout the uh throughout the day um, so that so that that really puts an emphasis on the diurnal heating to destabilize the atmosphere from below this is a interesting loop this is the 850 winds and heights loop and you notice that at the, at the beginning that secondary extension of the jet really doesn't exist but it starts to form around 18z and 21z and then kind of to some extent is still present at 0z and that is really indicative of those winds aloft being being mixed down to 850, and it's being and it's uh, becoming evident on a larger scale in the uh, in the composite in the composite uh, image. And then, uh, arguably, I think the most important uh, um, loop of of all of them is the cross section. You start off with really strong stability, and then as you start to heat up from below, you weaken that stability, and that allows for the momentum transfer to come down to the surface and not just um, stop along the boundary layer. So it's great that we looked at all of these planar view and cross sections of um, of our of our uh, of our composites, but now we want to go into the statistics because that's where we're going to get more objective results. So to orient yourselves on on uh, uh, the upcoming slide, I wanted to just zoom in on the 21z frequency curves that we are, we're, I'm about to show. Um, so this on the x-axis, that's the the score from zero to nine. We talked about that earlier. So zero is a poor score. Nine is a perfect score, and anything in between, um, you can interpolate between that. Um, the red curve represents the frequency of events, so the 27 cases occurring at a given score, and then the blue line represents all of the frequency of non-events or potential events um, at, a, at a given score. Um, and how we define potential events, we, we limited our... our, um, our definition of a potential event uh, using a couple of uh, a couple of criteria first it had to occur between 2006 and 2018 because that's how, how that's our temporal span from uh, the events uh, from the cases so they all occurred except for one that occurred late December of 2005 um, everything else occurred from 2006 to 2018 so we limited our our cases like that we also limited um, the months to exclude July August and September because no event occurred during those three months. So we only have um, the, uh, the, from October 1st of, a, of, a give, of one season to June 30th of the following year. Um, and then we also um, employed um, some code that looked for um, pressure minima in a given domain. And it was the domain we saw earlier in the talk. And if a pressure minimum, a closed pressure minimum or a well-defined trough passed through the region, it was identified as a case. If no trough went through or no low went through, we threw out the date, mainly because you're not going to get these outbreaks without the forcing. And we kind of established that already. That's the sufficient condition you need. So taking a look at 21Z and the rest of the times from 12Z to 0Z every three hours in the day of ignition, the reason why we've been focusing in on 21Z and 18Z, and it might be intuitive, but just to back it up with statistics, is that, that the spread of the scores and the quality of the of the of the composite and the cases is highest at these two times so we really want to focus in on 18z and 21z when we um, diagnose these these patterns zero z has a lot more variability um, and has and not as many uh, false alarm cases but uh, has a lot of variability there is some over there's a quite a bit of overlap at 15z and 12z between the two curves and the spread is 
more considerable than at 18Z and 21Z. Um, to back it up with a couple other statistics, this first curve um, is kind of this just ad hoc way of, of visualizing the difference between the red curve and the blue curve. So you want that difference to be maximized. You want your frequency of your of, of uh, events and non-events at a given score to be high, not low, because you want different differentiation between the, those frequencies. And you notice that that is maximized right there at 18Z and 21Z. So that's one kind of you know check. Okay, we've got the 18Z and 21Z seem to be um, the best times. Then using mean, median, and standard deviation, um, that's also giving us further verification that we, we need to investigate these times more closely. Um, 18Z has the highest uh, median score um, uh, for among the five times. Um, 21Z has the highest uh, mean score during the for the give for the five given times. But what's really important is that at 21Z, your standard deviation takes a a um, considerable hit, and it's a lot lower than the rest of the the rest of the times. And I really do think actually, if um, there was one kind of low scoring event at score to four or four and a half. At 18Z, I think if that was removed, then the uh, standard deviation would be a bit lower for the 18Z cases as well. So for the sake of going forward, we're going to focus in still on 21Z. And then finally, some um, signal detection stats um, that show that 21Z has relatively the most skill. Um, I want to explain the drop off in the POD really quickly. So the red line is uh, probability of detection. Blue line is false alarms, and the and the yellow line is uh, critical success index. And notice as your pro as your score gets higher, your probability of detection decreases consistently among all of the um, all of the times. And that's because no we those the, those POD um, statistics are based on the 27 cases, and no case scored a perfect nine because you're not going to have one of the constituents of the composite score exactly the same as the composite. It's just almost impossible that that's going to happen. Um, so that's why those POD curves go down, but with, uh, with, uh, with a seemingly better score. But what's interesting is that your false alarm rate also goes down and, and approaches very negligible values by the time you get to um, closer to eight, eight and a half, which is, uh, which is encouraging uh, going forward because future, future scores can definitely score an eight and a half or a nine. It's not out of the realm of possibility. Um, but if you notice, at 18Z and 21Z, your CSI is over 0.6, and um, at one point over here, it's a, at 0.7 when it, when it's when the cases score to seven or when the, uh, events score to seven, and uh, just the, just about 6.5, 6.4 when they score to 7.5. So there's there is a bit of skill, even even though we haven't in, included the magnitude um, of these features, which is something that's um, going to become evident in in, a, in the next few slides. That magnitude matters as well as um, the pattern. So let's take a look at some of these false alarms, those that overlap between um, the event curve and the non-event curve. So we took the, the top 75 scoring dates that scored above a six because it looked like consistently six to six and a half, that's where you were getting your um, two curves starting to overlap. So we took the top 75 scoring um, false alarms or potential events and uh, um, actually, they all ended up scoring over 6.5. So they were relatively high quality non-events and, and marginal cases. And we wanted to see what the differences were. And I really do think it's in the thermal fields. Um, this is two meter temperature again and mean sea level pressure in black at uh, Valida 21Z. On the left hand side is the events and on the uh, composite and on the right hand side is the false alarm composite for the, for the uh, top 75 cases. And you notice that the low level thermal ridge is not as well defined in this scenario as it is in the events case. So it looks like our, our something has happened to our, our diurnal heating, whether it's cloud cover or some other feature that's going on um, that has hindered diurnal heating. And, and you'll, and if you can, and, and putting two, to two, two and two together, you'll also have a problem destabilizing your atmosphere. So without that, without that warmest level of the, of the, um, uh, or our lowest level of the atmosphere warmings considerably, you're not going to get the destabilization. And that's also evident at 850. So this is again, 850 temperatures in red and mean sea level pressure in black, valid at 21Z for the events and false alarms. And the low level thermal ridge is very broad in the false alarm case and as opposed to a more well-defined amplified low level thermal ridge. 
Um, I do want to go back really quickly um, to point out the difference in magnitude between these two. You've got a pretty broad stroke of, of 87 degrees Fahrenheit among the two meter temperatures in the events case, and it struggles to touch 80 in the false alarm composites. So magnitude also seems to be an important factor, especially in the, te um, the temperature fields. And that is also evident in the A50 temperatures as well. The 20 isotherm, 20 Celsius isotherm is up in central Texas in this system relative composite. And it's almost off the screen in your, in your false alarm composite. So quite a bit of differences, not only in the pattern, but in the, um, in the, in the magnitude of these, of these features. So then we also have um, 850 winds and heights going on at 21Z. Um, this is, you've seen the one on the left before. The no most notable difference between the two features or the two, um, the two maps is that the one on the left has got the secondary extension like we've been talking about, that um, reflection of enhanced subsidence from aloft. And on the right in the false alarm composite, it's noticeable, but not nearly as intense. It's not nearly as broad. Um, so it doesn't look like as enhanced sub, um, uh, subsidence is occurring in, in this situation. And if we look at 500 millibars uh, heights and winds, it looks like while the jets are in a similar position, one seems to be a little bit further ahead of the other at the false alarm case. So your, your area of subsidence is really not in your co-located with your driest, warmest air. And the subsidence itself probably isn't that strong because your jet isn't as, uh, as, isn't as intense. And then we put this all together by looking at the cross sections. Again, the left is false events and the right is false alarms. And what we notice is that the um, false alarms have stronger stability. Um, those those um, uh, um, potential temperature lines are, are, a, bit, are a bit more um, packed together in the lowest levels of the atmosphere. They're still spread out a decent amount. Um, compared to the others uh, further up in the atmosphere, but not as uh, um, the uh, lapse rates aren't as weak in the false alarm cases as in the events. It's a stronger stability that's preventing these winds from mixing down to the surface. And I use the 25 knot isotac in my events description um, as kind of the, the bookmark. And if we look for, to see where that is in the false alarm composite, it's well above 850 and it's, you know, at its lowest point before getting to the uh, the, the more more moist half of the LLTR, um, it's maybe around 825, 850, or, or 825 to 800 millibars. So it's definitely a lot higher in the atmosphere. So your surface winds are going to be lower. So that leads us to the conceptual models, finally. Um, the events and the false alarms on the left and right, respectively, um, they look quite similar, but there is a notable difference. And I, I think that underscores how important it is to have certain features um, coincide at the right time. And that is that jet on the events composite, the area of enhanced, uh, or the area of favored subsidence is right under a drier, warmer area of, uh, of, um, uh, of the LLTR. Whereas over here in the false alarm composite, the jet is further ahead, kind of intersecting with the dry line at this point. So it's got a lot of, um, it's, it's got a lot less dry air to work with and, and cooler temperatures. Um, and, and that, and that low-level thermal ridge isn't as well defined. And really it comes down to not only do you get all of the features lining up at the same time in the same place, but also do you have them occurring at the correct time? So if this feature, if this setup occurred at 3Z, 6Z, your chance of getting a wildfire outbreak at that time of day or night at that point is quite low because you have not sufficiently warmed the atmosphere, dried the atmosphere, destabilized the atmosphere. There's a lot that goes into the coupling of this, uh, of this, um, of this phenomenon that would inhibit, uh, would inhibit wildfire outbreak growth. So now that we've just established that scoring paradigm and we've um, gone through some, some cases, uh, or we've gone through some, um, uh, some description of an event versus a, a false alarm, I wanted to look, see how the GEFS would handle an event and a non-event with time. So what we did was we scored each one of the members of the GEFS, including the control, um, starting at hour, I think 138 and going out to hour 24. Um, we did that for, we didn't want to do the whole um, the whole forecast run because it's, it's definitely tedious to download all that data, but we might want to go back and look even further. Um, and we'll show those results in a second. But the two cases that we highlighted 
um, at Todd's suggestion was, uh, the first one was the Ray Fire of uh, April 12, 2018, very prolific wildfire outbreak. Um, that top graphic over there, um, that four panel is a graphic that Todd and um, the other members of the, of the collaborative team that work on these wildfire outbreaks um, across the NWS and Southern and Central region will um, uh, put out for their partners at the Texas, Oklahoma and Kansas Forest Services. Um, and it's a probabilistic forecast of wildfire outbreaks. And you can see by day four, we've got a 30% chance. And then that, that um, probabilistic forecast increases in, uh, in own, not only size, but intensity or, or, or confidence um, or probability, I should say, as you get closer to the day of the event, which um, actually this fire, this was a two day event, the 12th and the 13th, and then it kind of reinvigorated a few days later. So this was a weeks long pain in the neck for, for, uh, for forecasters. And, and uh, of course the first responders and our partners out there in, in, uh, in those three states. And then the second case that we're gonna look at is from March of this year, March 30th of this year. And it was the pattern, according to forecasters in, in, at Norman and, and um, what Todd has relayed to me, the forecasters in, had said that this looks like a prime setup, but it doesn't seem like it's going to ignite a wildfire. And they wanted to see if their suspicions were confirmed using this methodology. So this was a proposed graphic that they never actually sent out to their, to their partners at the Forest Services. And it called for a 10% chance um, uh, or a 10 percent risk for wildfire outbreaks and or significant wildfire in the southern Great Plains, right mainly in uh, West Texas. Um, so we wanted to score these two with using the GFS data in order to see how they how uh, how the how the model would would uh, score it. And we used the 18z, the val valid time for 18z, and we used the 18z composite mainly because GEFS does not uh, not does not have a 21z product. So the um, first case, like I said, those gray lines are going to be the uh, the me or the uh, the scores for each one of the um, uh, each one of the members at uh, at eighteen z valid or uh, valid at eighteen z for forecast hours one thirty eight going to twenty four. The red line represents the average of those scores, and the green line represents the standard deviation of those scores. Um, and then that black line for six is kind of a benchmark as to anything below that, you would start to consider either a false alarm or, or a poor score, so maybe a non-event. Anything higher than six, you're gonna consider more on the, on the in the realm of the atmosphere is conducive for a wildfire outbreak and we need to investigate this further and employ more members of the fire triangle, the fuels and the topography to see if things are setting up uh, preferentially. Um, it shouldn't really be a fine line, it should be more of a box. I, I, don't, I don't believe that, you know, that, that that score is the ultimate end all be all threshold. Um, but we'll see in a moment um, how that works out. But for the first for the first case, uh, it, it scored pretty well. It ended up scoring around a 7.5 once all was said and done. Um, there's a lot of variability starting off as you would expect as your lead times are a little bit longer, um, but your average score is trending upward, which is what you wanna see. You're, you're forecasting to see that you're, you're looking at the trends of these forecasts um, as your lead time decreases. And give even though the for, even though the standard deviation seems to jump up and down, it peaks and then it valleys and then it peaks again and it goes down and up and down. Um, given a few of those members, the majority of them are honing in on a higher solution. They've already at hour 108, so about four and a half days out, you've already surpassed that that six threshold. So you're getting higher and higher. And by the time you get to about you know, three and a half to four days you've really honed in on a solution again, save for a couple of uh, members. And I have, if we have more time at the end, we, I have a couple of uh, box and whisker plots that illustrate this a little bit better. Um, most of the members hone in on a solution of a, of a higher scoring event. And then as you get further and further away from your longer lead times and you're getting closer to the event, those standard deviations start to drop further and the members start to converge on a solution of about 7.5. So I think it scored pretty well. It, it, it correctly identified that the atmospheric pattern was right for a wildfire outbreak in this case. And then for the second case, same kind of thing to start off. You've got quite a bit of variability in the longer lead times. And then as you, you're starting to trend upwards, your scores are starting to trend upwards on average. And then right around 108, all of the score or all of the members seem to not tightly um, uh, coalesce on a solution, but get um, get the general picture of things and the standard deviation of those scores starts to tank. And it stops around six and then it kind of plateaus for a little while. Then it actually starts to trend downward to around a 5.8 and that's where it ends up. 
uh, before hour 24. So what this would tell would tell me is that there is the potential for a wildfire outbreak, but there are negating factors. There are problems with the forecast. There are problems with the setup that don't make this a full blown um, uh, perfect scenario for at least atmospherically for a wildfire outbreak. So I just want to sum everything up. I've been talking for a little while about this. So let's just um, go back and, re and revisit some of those research goals that I had in the start to start off. First, did we further refine the atmospheric conceptual model for these outbreaks? And I think that we have. Um, we did, we, we um, have built upon the great work that Todd and Greg and everybody at, at, in, so, in Southern region, Central region have done in these, in these conceptual models um, by identifying the absolute necessity for the coupling of the atmosphere that you've got mid-level winds mixing down to the surface. Um, and we've kind of verified that in a system relative uh, uh, paradigm. Um, did, then we developed and implemented a systematic method to score these patterns using correlation statistics over the domain. Um, we scored multiple important fields and assessed the environment um, uh, with, with some skill. And then through that, we identified false alarms and more importantly, differences between the events and the false alarms. And that really boils down to, have we destabilized the atmosphere properly? Um, if we don't destabilize the atmosphere from the, from the surface and we don't have intense um, surface heating, uh, we're not going to get the nearly neutral stability that we that that is required to mix that wind uh, mix those winds down to the surface. And then finally, we wanted to assess the skill of those of that of that paradigm. And I think again, we take a, we took a look at a few cases. I think we should take a look at more to see how they all scored. Um, but in the few that we looked at, it looks like the scoring paradigm correctly identifies the atmospheric pattern and, and how the forecasters were um, were were seeing this system you know what the ray fire looked like it was going to be um what it was a pretty prolific wildfire outbreak and then for the um and then for the march 30th 2020 case it was a borderline case but there were some um negatives that were kind of hindering the wildfire outbreak um uh forecast but as i've said throughout all of this we we definitely want to improve on most of this stuff um the first thing i want to do is as they occur add more cases and further refine the conceptual model. Um, we have 27 cases, which I think is, is relatively robust for how often these occur, um, but they, um, I think adding more as they, as they occur uh, will definitely help in, in narrowing down these, these, fe these features. Um, we want to incorporate magnitude, as I've said several times, into the scoring uh, methodology using something like standardized anomaly. Um, the problem with using, we originally tried using mean absolute error, but that ends up kind of, making your scores useless because then at some point you're not going to have a well you can't compare apples to oranges number one and number two you can't have a top score you can't have a, a perfect score you're always going to have there's no, no ceiling to your scoring methodology which is not helpful um so using standardized anomalies and playing with the numbers a little bit you can definitely work out a top score or or, or preserve a top score um, then we would apply, we want to apply weighting functions to the fields possibly because some fields are more important than others in these situations. Um, we composite and score 500 heights, but that may not be impor as important as two meter temperatures. And um, we kind of saw that the two meter temperature um, field and, and magnitude to some extent is, is very important in, in these uh, systems developing. And then finally, and I think this is the most um, near term realistic is to score this data in real time through SIPs and um, SIPs is, and, and uh, Dr. Graves who, who um, oversees SIPs here, it's here in uh, St. Louis. Um, we're working on getting that implemented on a web page here um, uh, as he retools um, some, some of the features of SIPs uh, um, going to SIPs 2.0 as he, as he uh, keeps calling it. Um, with that, I want to thank you all for your attention. I really do appreciate uh, Jim asking me to come on here and, and uh, talk about my research. I'm really excited about it, and I welcome any questions, comments, uh, even concerns you have about what, what we're doing moving forward. Um, my email address and my Twitter handle are there on the screen if you want to reach out to me to chat more. Um, I do want to acknowledge that Comet uh, uh, has graciously funded par uh, part of this research and we are very appreciative to the to the comet program for uh, for providing some funding for us to uh, hire an undergrad assistant who really helped out with uh, um, identifying wildfire um, uh, whether or not a wildfire occurred for the false alarm so it was very helpful um, a really helpful grant and uh, yeah i'll open up the floor to any questions thank you very much for your attention